There we are. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Cute Today Talk. We are about to watch the recorded video called Better UI or HMI Development Workflows with Cutes or QML, uh, presented by Marco Piccolino. So let's bring Marco on really quickly, just so you can see him and say hello. Hi, Marco. <laughs> Hi there. Hello, everybody. Great to have you here. Uh, let me yes. let me introduce you all to who Marco is. Uh, he designs UIs and develops Qt front end applications for his desktop, mobile, and embedded. His areas of interest include clean architectures and design systems, and he has a research background in human speech recognition. So uh, here's what the talk will be about today. Uh, development workflows are usually influenced by external factors like specifications, uh, stakeholders, processes, technology, markets, and hence they're quite project specific. Yet uh, different workflows are likely to share a few common goals. Among these, we identify three, uh, to prototype quickly, maintain easily, and grow painlessly. So in this hands-on talk by Marco, you will be exposed to a few concepts, technologies, and tools related to UI or HMI development with Qt or QML. And these concepts, techniques, and tools should help you improve your day-to-day -day workflows uh, to prototype quickly and to maintain uh, easily and grow painlessly. Uh, so everyone, <laughs> thank you for that. And uh, everyone Thanks, stay tuned until the end for the live Q&A. We'll bring Marco back here. And I just want to remind everyone who is here that uh, if you do have questions to ask, uh, we have different chats for them. We have the room chat and the Q&A chat, uh, the one with the little question mark icon. So uh, it's not the help button. <laughs> so please uh, ask your questions there and then we'll have them here uh, for Marco to answer after the video. So yeah. stay tuned and I'll see you afterwards. Thanks. Enjoy. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to this Q-Day 2020 talk. My name is Marco Piccolino. I am the director and the senior UX developer at Tillblue. Tillblue is a small digital solutions provider based in Bergamo, Italy, and serving mostly Europe. Tillblue provides uh, software development services, um, training and uh, consultancy especially when it comes to user interface and human machine interface development and we are specialized in Qt technologies. So if you want to know more about Tillblue just check out the website till.blue or send me an email uh, and you'll find my address at the end of this talk. Today's talk is about UI and HMI development and we're gonna talk about workflows and Workflows with Qt and QML. Let's try and frame the issue a little bit. When implementing user interfaces, we might set out a few goals when it comes to the way we want to work. Um, for example, here I'm showing you three goals that I figure out are common to many people, many UI developers. The first one is to prototype quickly. The second one is to maintain easily uh, your code. And the third one is to grow the code painlessly. What does it mean to prototype quickly? It means to find and fix user experience design issues early on and to iterate on those. No? You get a design from a, your design team, you implement it quickly, give it back, uh, they might test it with users, uh, you get immediately uh, to see whether that design is working with the users or not. And Qt, uh, Qt allows to do that. Uh, the second point would be to fix and find implementation issues while creating your views and components. So 
you want to have a prototype where on which you want to put your hands on early on just to find implementation related issues not only design related issues the second goal would be to maintain the code easily which means that finding and fixing implementation issues in use cases that come from the past whether it was you implementing them or someone else should be easy and quick as well the third goal could be to grow your code painlessly so whenever you want to add a new use case a new feature you do that without big trouble and also without breaking existing code and existing use cases so achieving uh, these three goals requires having workflows however UI development does not happen in a vacuum we as developers uh, have context the context uh, shows itself in many ways here I am showing you just a few contexts that I identified uh, you might come up with more we start with specifications Spe specifications can come in the form of flowcharts of mockups of user stories of style guides and then processes like waterfall iterative incremental that depends on a lot on how our organization is set up then we've got the markets we've got input from the markets directly or indirectly so user feedback uh, market evolution competition in the market ethics security and then technology what is our target hardware our target platform what host tools are we using what hardware are we, are we using on our host and also another very important point is the stakeholders uh, stakeholders like our teammates uh, like other people in our organization the customer if if we have a direct relationship with the customer uh, and there are many aspects related to to stakeholders there might be pressure trust taste second thoughts so all these elements we should take them into consideration when thinking about what could be the best development workflow for a specific project so given such a wide context you can see that there we cannot speak about the best way to implement a UI development workflow and probably there is no single way where we can achieve the three goals that I spoke about so prototype quickly maintain easily and grow painlessly there there are probably more ways and each way will be tied to the context you're in yet you might agree that any workflow we come up with uh, will need to rely on some concepts some techniques and some tools so a workflow can be seen as a combination of concepts techniques tools and on their sequence on the sequence in which we apply them um, so what these talks want to do is to give you some concepts some techniques some tools to help you improve your development uh, workflow so we're not setting a defined workflow for you and just giving you some tools to make it easier for you to set out your own workflow so let's dive in this tip is about a tool a tool that should come useful especially for prototyping and the tool is QML scene. You might already know it. It comes with your Qt distribution. If you don't know it, you should start using it today for prototyping because it gives you a few interesting 
advantages. First of all, it allows you to save compilation time. That is, it is quicker to preview your UI with QML scene compared to running and compiling your application uh, several times. So, and the more your application, your client application becomes heavy, the more you've got this advantage. The second um, advantage is that it helps you visualize a component's intrinsic properties even when this component is uh, out of context. And this is good if you're developing components that should be responsive or show up in different views, in different contexts, to check out how they behave when uh, no additional uh, geometry properties like width and height are configured for them. So how do we launch QML scene? Under tools, external, Qt Quick, Qt Quick to preview. QML scene. Not, do not confuse it with QML Viewer, which is a legacy tool for Q, Q, Quick One components. As you can see, when you click on QML scene, uh, it previews the current document, so the document that is currently open in Qt Creator. Now, QML scene is a command line tool, but as you can see, it is already integrated in Qt Creator. The drawback with Qt Creator is that it doesn't provide a keyboard shortcut by default for the tool. So the first thing that you want to do is to set it up. Under Environment, Keyboard, look for QML scene, select it, select Pre, Key Sequence and Record, choose a sequence. I'm going to use Control, Alt and Accented U on my Italian keyboard just to make sure that it doesn't overlap with other commands but you can choose whatever you want as long uh, and as there are no conflicts and Qt Creator here will tell you whether a, a shortcut is conflicting with some other tool so when you're ready stop recording and OK now whenever I press Ctrl Alt U QML scene opens up checking this document if you want to check out how my component looks because it's not really showing up here you see I've got a red rectangle which is this one but I don't have this my component showing up so what I want to do is to go into my component and fire QML scene I'm just seeing a uh, very small version of this component which is bound to the QML scene window so I should really probably need to add some implicit dimensions to this component okay looks better now and now I can see my component here on the right okay so um, using this tool in, in your development cycle is good especially at the beginning of your development and to figure out basic geometric properties of your items however when you when you start having some uh, UI related code in C++ like setting something about your themes, your icons, uh, custom components, plugins, uh, this tool becomes less useful. But to start off it, it is really speeds up your uh, development. So if you are not yet using it just um, give it a try. This tip is about a uh, concept. The concept is that of state machines and the tip says use state machines to abstract view flows. So this is a technique that might come handy, sorry, a concept that might come handy for prototyping, for easier maintenance of your code and also for growing your, your uh, UI uh, painlessly. Um, 
Qt provides a few a few different uh, flavors of state machines, and but they are all based on state charts, which are also called uh, hierarchical state machines and are quite powerful formal tool. Um, what it, is it all about? You could leverage state machines to manage your UI state in a more abstract way. So modeling um, user flows, the user journey, for example, in, um, in an abstract way and then using different um, graphical metaphors to um, visualize this journey. Uh, for example, you could use a stack view to manage your views or you could use a, a show hide technique where you hide a view and then show another one with the visibility property. Um, you can have several different um, visual metaphors and still have the same logical flow underneath. This is possible with state machines. The first way to do that is with a QML framework. Let's see an example here. Here I've got a window with two rectangles that represent views, a home view and a favorites view. And there is a button in each view that allows me to move to the other view. Okay, so right now uh, nothing happens if I click on this button. I'm just showing the, the favorites view, which is the second one and uh, what i want to achieve is that whenever i click this button on favorites view this view uh, disappears and i move to the home view which is a light blue as you as you can see here okay so one way of achieving that with in a sort of abstract way is by using qtml state machine and with an alias and then I'll explain now why we are using an alias um, so though I want to create a state machine and give it an ID I want to create a state and as you can see since this QML type is called state that could conflict with quick states and this is why we are using this alias now this state will be called home view state and another state will be called favorites view state so I want to move from this to this and when I move from this to this something should ap happen in my UI to do this, I need to have state transitions, which are called signal transitions in this QML module. Uh, I have to specify a target state, and the target state in this case will be the favorites view state, and here the same. Okay, so when moving um, from this to this, I need something to react to, which will be a signal. And the signal is that provided by the button. So the button is called Go Favorites. And the signal is the clicked signal, of course. Then In this case, we've got a go home and again clicked. Now, what do I want to happen when I move from one to the other? I want something to happen in my UI and my views. And now I do a very simple thing, just hide the home view. And when I go to favorites and hide the favorites view, when I want to display home, home. okay? So in this, in each state, I will say unentered home view visible and on exit 
it home view visible false okay same thing for favorites but here of course favorites and here as well favorites and here we are okay so one more thing i want my state machine to be running already when i open my ui gui and i want to set the initial state which will be the home view state okay not working so i certainly forgot uh, to do something uh, let's see don't get safer as you say the favorites clicked uh, oh yes I forgot to make them invisible at start right okay so I've got a logic workflow for my UI and I can change what happens visually by by acting on these signal handlers on entered and on exited another very useful thing that uh, Kit framework provides is a uh, XML state machines which are these state charts which provide you a visual way of expressing a state machine as I did it now in QML so you can check that out and look at the documentation it's very useful as well in, in many cases. All right, hi everyone. We're just going to take about a five minute break and then we'll start again with the second half of the video. So it's about 53 now, let's say at 58, we'll be back here. All right, have a nice break.
All right, everyone, welcome back from the break. I hope you had a nice little pause. We're going to now watch the second half of the video. So please stay tuned for uh, any questions you may have, because if, uh, if you do, we'll have Marco here at the end to answer them. So enjoy and see you after the video. This tip is about a technique and it says set up and start using your target devices uh, as soon as possible. Um, it says basically that you instead of just using um, the prototyping capabilities of your host you should try and test your UI code as soon as possible on one of your target devices for several reasons. First of all, you can avoid losing time on deployment related issues at or near deadlines, which is uh, very important. So you make sure that your uh, drive towards the device is smooth if a demo is coming up and you can always provide a demo in zero time if someone jumps in uh, in your uh, in your uh, laboratory. Um, and also uh, you can discover problems on the device with the form factor, touch interaction, sensitiveness, performance, uh, uh, platform issues early on. And then you can review your design and implementation accordingly. So after you have seen there is an issue, you can decide on how to proceed. The drawback of, of uh, going to device often is of course that it's uh, usually slower than previewing on the host machine. Uh, however, you can check out tools like QML Live or Gamma Ray or Felgo that give you um, live preview hot reloading on, on host and that could speed up your, uh, your um, testing on devices at least uh, in some cases. Uh, also, another note, make sure that your host hardware uh, is fast. If your host hardware is fast, then compiling, even cross-compiling will not take so much time and you can deploy uh, more often and uh, with less friction. Uh, you can check uh, everything that needs to be set up depending on your on your target platform as a simple example for example to go to Android quickly you would have to have the kit installed enable it and then check out in Qt Creators settings that under the devices tab that everything is properly configured okay here I don't have red lights, it means I have configured everything already from the JDK to SDK, NDK, SSL, uh, virtual devices and I'm ready to go with just uh, by just switching and pressing the deploy button. So make sure that whatever your target device is you can run your code early on uh, and that will help you with both prototyping and maintenance and uh, code improvements. This tip is about a uh, technique and it says to use list models append for simpler mock model code. Uh, what happens usually when you start developing a UI? You want to use some um, mock models so that you can fill up your views uh, but then um, there are a few differences in the API of um, JSON models JSON based models and Q variant based models and uh, real models 
what is it about let's look at this simple example here we've got a list view uh, with with uh, a text displaying a uh, name and a text displaying an age and uh, then we've got a model which is uh, just a javascript array people model okay you see it's used here as a model of this list view uh, with name and age okay you can see that there is nothing to be seen because to see something I need to add the model data scope okay now I can see my mock data so uh, when I have a real model a model coming from C++ I cannot use this um, um, this notation it might be a, a, a C++ model that comes from QAbstract item model or some other uh, model but this notation doesn't work there I have two options either I use this notation or this notation so without the model prefix at all this becomes inconvenient because every time I want to use a real model as opposed to a, a mock model, things become complex. The alternative would be to use list model as a mock model, but list model, as you know, is based on use uh, list elements. It's declarative, and so it is not very um, convenient for mocking up because it requires writing. Um, quite uh, substantial code and usually you get data directly from JSON data sources so you might want to prefer using uh, uh, that kind of thing well the good um, news is that we can still leverage list model as a structure so we transform this this into a list model and by means of the let's give me ID let's give it an ID first and by means of um, the append method that we can call on component on completed it is possible to use uh, JSON or JavaScript data. Let me show you like this to <coughs> use the model notation. So here we go. And whenever I, when I, as soon as I will have a people model coming from C, I just need to um, disable this block of code and everything will be running uh, equally well this tip is about a concept and uh, is a co it is a concept that should help you in prototyping in maintaining your code base and also in growing it and the tip says have a single layer for UI business logic interaction. What do we mean by that? We mean that instead of referencing your logic objects in several scattered UI components within your uh, QML, you should choose one layer of abstraction, uh, a type of component, and use that as an interface between the user interface and the logic layer. Let's see an example of that and how to do it and then we'll see what the advantages of this approach are. So here I've got a tiny demo application which is a to-do list. You've got uh, a couple of items when you click on them um, they should be get be checked and when you click a button then you can add uh, new items. So to make things simple, I'm just printing some messages 
I click on this one, check to do, you can see here, this one as well, and then add item, add to do. How is this view composed? We've got a window with a template which represents this view in particular. And then this small connection object is just for printing, for logging uh, uh, the actions. What are actions and how they are implemented? Actions here are exposed from C++, so they are signals that are exposed to QML and then will trigger something maybe in my application backend. They are exposed in the usual way with a set context property for the actions. And also the model for the to-do list is exposed as a QString list to QML. I'm adding some demo items here and exposing the model here. Okay. So very simple, very standard application. Now, where is the glue between uh, QML and C++ in this application or between the UI and the logic layer to speak better? Here I've got my to-dos template, which is made of a to-do list and a button. And the to-do list has a reference to the model, to-dos model. And in the item delegate on clicked, I call the action. So has, here I have a, re a reference to the actions. Then if I go to to do template, the button has a reference to the action add to do on clicked. You can see that actions here are scattered around, so to speak. So what I want to do is to bring all these references to the logic at the same level. A way of doing it is using uh, property aliases. Okay, I can make it read only because I want to be changing this component. And I will create a property alias as well for the add to do button. Here we are. And then once I've done this, I can remove this reference. And I choose to keep my references to C++ in this main.qml. So within the template, I will do to do, uh, to do, now let's start with add to do button on clicked. And I call into my action from here. Then <coughs> to do list, I want to do the same kind of refactoring, but since this is a list, I've got several item delegates. I want to expose a signal at this level, call it item clicked. Okay, the argument is not important now. So whenever one item is clicked, instead of calling the action directly, we call into item clicked and let's say true. And then let's remove this re reference to the model as well. Back to main. So on item clicked, action check to do, and here we had we had this argument checked, and then to do list model to do model. Okay. So my code is doing exactly the same things as before, but now all the references to my C++ and business logic entities are in this main.qml file. If I launch the application, you can see that the actions are still called correctly and my items are visualized here. 
So what are the advantages of this kind of approach? First of all, it helps you keeping your UI always testable because now this to-do template does not have any references to logic objects and it's easier to test. Second, it allows to find quicker whether a bug is in the UR or in the logic. And third, it gives you a better mental model of your application. So I recommend maybe you try this kind of approach out if you are not already using it and uh, let me know how it goes for you. This tip is about a concept and the concept says use a style guide application to document your UI. Now this concept comes handy for prototyping, for maintaining your application and also for growing it. What is it all about? It is basically about creating another application which should load just your UI without loading all the logic and should load your UI in a different way than you do in your main application. Uh, let's see an example immediately so that you can better understand what I'm talking about. In this project, I've got a QML application. Let's start it up. It basically shows a home screen, welcome home, and then a button, go to favorites. Clicking on the button, I see a list of favorite items. I can click on these items and nothing happens right now. And I can go back to the home screen. Okay, very simple application, very standard. The data is exposed uh, from C++, favorites model, and also the actions that are triggered when clicking on a button are exposed from C++. And then I've got a small uh, QML state machine to take care of the UI flow. But that's not interesting for now. What is interesting is that I've got these two templates, a home template and a favorite te tem favorites template. Now, what is the problem? That every time that I want to check how the favorites template looks like, I have to fire up the application and then click on this button. And then maybe I would like to look to check out how the detail of a favorite item look like when that is implemented. It takes time, all these clicks, and eh? even if, I, especially when I do it uh, several times. What I can do to improve uh, this situation is to create a style guide application, which is uh, uh, structured this way. So this is my main project, simple uh, QMake project. Then within a UI folder, I create another project. And I add my QML files to, to this internal UI project called style guide. Um, I can move my QML um, documents from the main application if, if they were created before. So this is the basic structure. And then let's put this. What is the structure of this style guide application? It has a QRC file listing all my QML documents and a main file, which is different from my application's main file. As you can see, this main file, for example, says my style guide and just contains a swipe view for now with a page indicator. Okay nothing to be seen. So what do I want to do in this swipe view? I want to list all my views and my components to be able to check them out more quickly. I start adding my home template, save, start up the application and here I see it, okay? It is just without logic, only the, the UI. Then I can add the favorites template, fire it up, and now with this wide view I can move between the two easily to check them out, okay? I will not have a swipe view in my final application, but I use this swipe view just to check the views. 
what I can do more, I can check the single components of my application, for example, by adding the go to button to this column and also adding the favorites list and fire it up again. You can see there is a new page in the swipe view. One, two. Ah, okay. So this is how my go to button looks like by default, and this is how my list looks like by default. So I might want to improve on that. I might want, for example, my go to button to have a default label. Let's put it in brackets. Fire up again. And there we are. Now, if I'm focusing on my uh, buttons, for example, I can even change the current index to two, and my swipe view will open up on that very same page, and it's way quicker. Then I could also, for example, add some uh, mock data to the favorites list. Simple, just a simple uh, JavaScript model. Item one, item two. Okay, something still missing. This doesn't have a size, so I might want to add some implicit measures for it. Okay, here it is. So my components in this way are more reusable and more uh, inspectionable. I could also add uh, data to the list from C++. This is another added advantage of using uh, an application for the style guide. So you can see that it helps you check in the consistency of designs and implementations. It helps you, spot, helps you spotting UI regressions. It helps you testing behavior of reusable and adaptive components, especially so you, you can check out how your components look like in different, in different views, in different uh, containers. And it provides a QML scene-like iteration when you need some C++ code. Um, check out style guides that are published online, many web applications, especially uh, provide public style guides where you or your design team can take inspiration from and uh, I hope you can take advantage of this technique. Oh, and by the way, I don't want this implicit height and width in the style guide, but I want to take them back to the component so that the component the list, the favorites list in this case, um, has some implicit size that gives it uh, at least some sort of appearance whenever I, I insert it into a view. Okay, so that was it. So uh, I showed you a few concepts, techniques and tools to improve your uh, UI development workflows with Qt and QML. I hope you could take advantage of what, of what you've seen today, at least some of it. And if you've got any feedback, any other tips to share or any comment, just reach out to me at marco.piccolino at uh, till.blue and uh, enjoy the rest of the Q-Day talks. Goodbye. All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that uh, the video. I see that we have some questions coming up. So uh, without further ado, let's bring on Marco to answer some of those questions.
Hello, Marco. <laughs> Welcome Hi. back. Uh, before we get Thanks. started, I just want to say thank you all. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here, for your contribution to Q today, uh, even if it is virtually this year. We're happy to have mm -hmm. you. Yeah, I, I mean, looking at the dome in Florence was a different experience, but yeah, let's take it for what it is. Sure, sure. Yeah, of course, we'd love to do it in person, hopefully next year. Uh, yeah. Fingers crossed with that. For sure. Uh, so before we get into the Q&A, do you have anything you wanted to say about your participation in Q today? Uh, no, I think, yeah, I showed a few tricks. Maybe some are more interesting for beginners. Some maybe are for uh, intermediate or advanced uh, QML users. So uh, just um, if you if there is anything that comes to your mind connected to these things right now, just uh just ask me or give me a comment and i see there are two questions right absolutely yeah we'll go ahead and proceed with them uh the first one comes from mateo hi mateo, mateo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he says isn't it always safer to refer to root dot item clicked value instead of calling a generic item clicked that could be already defined in that scope yeah yeah what, what mateo is referring to is an example in which we are calling a signal in the root, in the top uh, most uh, element from an inner uh, from an inner element, and uh, putting the ID of the root element is always safer. Yeah, you are right, Matteo. So uh, let's do that. I I wasn't doing it in my example just because there was not the focus, and I was sure there were no conflicts. But uh, certainly, that's the safest thing to do and it's a very good practice. Great, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. It's good to have that note for people who weren't thinking about it. Uh, all right, so the next one is from Maurizio. He says, uh, using a single or, uh, oh, sorry, signal, using a signal or exposing an alias only works if loaders are not involved. And uh, how do we do that when loader comes into play? Okay, yeah, this is also a good question. And because loaders are always a bit special. Um, so loaders are a, a sort of component that allows you to load the QML documents dynamically at runtime. Um, and hence they're a bit peculiar in the way they interact with other uh, elements and components. So when it comes to signals, the accepted way is to, to use these connections object, an object, a QML object, a QML element that is called connections, and, and then have that point uh, to the component that is loaded. You will find that in loader's standard documentation. Uh, whereas to aliases, I don't think they should be treated any differently than other properties of the component that is being loaded. Uh, so to the external world, aliases are just uh, properties. The difference is uh, between the root element and the children of the root element. So you should treat them the same way you should you treat other properties, which might Required to, yeah, maybe set up the same properties in the loader depends a bit on the use case. I hope it was clear. Great, thank you for that. Yes, uh, it seems like that was the last question for today. Uh, so if you have any questions you find out later, you can definitely contact Marco. Uh, he put that contact information uh, in his video. So uh, thanks for all yes, of the people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And thank you for the participants uh, for coming. And of course, to you, Marco, we hope to see you in the next edition. Thanks. I hope the same. Absolutely. Enjoy the rest of the talks. Thank you. You too. All right. Take care, Marco. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.
All right, everyone, that concludes the video for now. Uh, next, we have a talk at 3.40 p.m., so in about 10, 13 minutes from now, called What's New in 3D for Qt 5.14, uh, 5.15, and Beyond by Mike Cruz. Uh, so please, after you finish uh, watching this, if you can rate it on the agenda page of the um, Qt conference, we would really appreciate that. All right, hope to see you in another talk. Take care. Bye-bye.